Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good to have you here for another lectionary Bible study. This uh, study for today is for the fourth Sunday in Advent, which will be December 20th in 2020. We're going to be looking at three texts, one from Romans, one from Luke chapter 1, and then the final one is uh, from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, the theme for this Sunday's Advent readings uh, really comes down to um, building a house or a temple for God. It's sort of the theme that's sort of underlying um, the Old Testament in the Gospel reading, uh, because we're going to find the Annunciation to Mary in Luke chapter 1, and we're going to find uh, the covenantal promise to David that his house shall be established forever. So those are two really big, important texts for both the church and for Scripture. And so we're going to try to spend a little bit more time on those two, uh, more so than the smaller epistle reading from Romans chapter 16. Uh, we are going to start with that text, and so uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. So our first reading we're going to look at is the epistle reading. So this is Romans 16, 25 to 27. And this comes at the end of uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. So this is the last chapter. This is the last thing that he says uh, in his letter to the Romans. And so let's go ahead and read it now. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so we only got three verses here, 25, 26, and 27. Uh, 25 and 26 are one long incomplete sentence. And by incomplete sentence, I mean that um, the issue here is we don't have uh, a subject and a verb necessarily. So in it, I mean, that's what I mean by a complete sentence. You have, with the phrases that are being used here, you don't have, in both the Greek and in the English, which is why there isn't a period, there's a long dash at the end of 26, um, you just sort of have this phrase upon phrase upon phrase upon phrase, and you don't ever get to uh, a subject and a verb. So that's just a grammatical note. If, if that if these verses sound odd to your ear, um, that's why. And it's because in English, it doesn't form a complete sentence the way that we would expect it uh, to, to be. Uh, what we have here is sort of a, at the end we have a doxology, which I was explaining to uh, Steve earlier last week, um, that a doxology is a prayer of praise, basically. And so that's what 27 is. So when we're looking at 27, uh, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, and so uh, what we have here is actually, so uh, when you look at 27, to the only wise God uh, be glory forevermore. This section... So these five words are actually two titles, okay? So in the Greek, and it doesn't come across in English very well, and it would probably be better if, you know, you could probably solve this problem with a comma right here. Uh, so really what's happening, Paul is saying, to the only God and to the wise God. So it, it doesn't come across this way, and you wouldn't notice it if, if I didn't point it out here. Uh, but Paul is stating that God is the only one, and he is the wise one. And to him belongs the glory forevermore uh, through Jesus Christ. So it's Christ who has shown that God is the only God, and that he is the one uh, deserving of praise, or because of Christ, God receives praise, and because he does that, because he has disclosed the mystery 
uh, that Paul is talking about here in the text. If you're wondering what that background noise was, that was me reminding myself to shut the door, otherwise it echoes through the entire top floor of the church. Um, and so when we're looking at this top part here, 25 to 26, um, what Paul is doing is he is stating once more the revelation of the mystery. And so Christ, so Jesus Christ, is the subject of the mystery of Scripture, all of Scripture. So when we look at, uh, like we're going to look at today, when you look at 2 Samuel 7 and the one who is going to sit on David's throne forever, who's that going to be? Well, that's a mystery for all of Scripture. Who is going to be the suffering servant in Isaiah? Well, that's a mystery for all of Scripture. Uh, what does the day of the Lord look like? Well, it's a mystery until we get to Jesus. Uh, so when we're looking at all of, the, um, all of the prophetic writings, which Paul is mentioning here, um, we, we see all of it being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the revelation of the mystery. And that's the subject of his preaching um, and his gospel. Now, evidently, and I was doing some reading on, on this text, that this phrase, my gospel, there are some critics who will say, oh, see, this is Paul distinguishing his message from the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, so according to my gospel, which is different than the preaching of Jesus Christ, uh, according to the revelation of the mystery. And so it, it's making a mountain out of a molehill here where Paul uses the phrase my, uh, my gospel as if it is a, his own, as if it's unique to him uh, and not simply his preaching of the gospel. And so if we see this phrase, my gospel, and think, oh, well, see, this is Paul's thing uh, and not Jesus, we've made a mistake. And this happens, so on a side note here, this also happens with our language in regarding the, the four gospels in the New Testament. So how do we, what do we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, in the New Testament, what we have is the titles uh, Kata Matthew or Kata Mark. And Kata means in Greek, according to. And so the official titles of the four gospels are the gospel according to Mark or the gospel according to Luke or the gospel according to John. And the reason why they're titled that is because there is only one gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so to talk about having four gospels in the New Testament is a little bit confusing because there's really only one. It's Christ's, it's the good news of Jesus Christ is the only gospel in all of scripture. So if you call it the Gospel of Matthew, it makes it sound like Matthew has his own gospel, which is different than Luke's gospel, which is different than John's gospel, uh, when in fact the gospel as a whole term is all about Jesus. And so you get um, some people can be a bit picky or stubborn I know this sounds so weird when talking about Christians uh, that be they'd be uh, particularly you know um, hard lined about something. Uh, so no, I'm not. Gonna, I'm never going to be a stickler, except maybe with the confirmation students about what do you call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, because we we sort of deal with what people call it. Um, but it's a little long winded to say every time the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Matthew, when you could just say the gospel of Matthew or Matthew. So anyway, uh, that's one of those little tidbits of stubbornness that pops up in, in certain circles. Um, and it sort of finds its own little uh, problems when we start looking at some of the, uh, when we look at this verse here, when we talk about Paul and his own gospel. Um, Paul recognizes there is only one gospel, and it is Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if he says it, Apollo says it, Peter says it, Matthew, Mark, or Luke say it. Uh, it's all one gospel. So that's a, a little tangent there on the text. Um, and so the rest of this is sort of pointing out how God is revealing Jesus Christ through the prophets. 
uh, and, and who he's revealing them to now, which is to make known to all the nations. Uh, this is especially important when talking to a Gentile audience in Rome. Uh, most of the people here probably aren't Jewish and they don't have the prophetic writings in the same way that the Jews did, uh, but Paul and Christ has made known this revelation of the mystery to all nations according to the command of the eternal God. So this is God's will that all nations are brought to the understanding of the revelation of the mystery. And because this is God's will, he deserves the glory as the only and wise God um, through Jesus Christ because God has now brought the revelation of Jesus Christ in the gospel to all people, which is a thing highly to be praised. Okay, so that's three verses on uh, the end of Romans. Um, pretty straightforward text. And, uh, and we'll leave it there. Uh, probably not preaching on this one because it's just, there's, it's tough to get a whole sermon out of, out of that unless I'm going to focus in on one little phrase. Um, now, let's look at the Old Testament reading and... Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about its significance in the Old Testament uh, and its structure. So here we have 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11 and verse 16 thrown in there at the end. Now when the king, and this is King David, lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent from my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built up me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus, shall say, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house, and your house and your kingdom shall be made, for, made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Okay, so that's 2 Samuel 7. And 2 Samuel 7 functions as one of four or five major covenants in the Old Testament. And so what do I mean by that? Well, let's draw a picture. So we'll come back to that in a second. There are, according to my Old Testament professors that I in general listen to, there are four covenants, okay? There are conditional and unconditional. So there are two types of covenants in the Old Testament. Um, the conditional covenant is the Mosaic covenant which is made with Moses on Sinai. This is often called the Sinai Covenant or the Mosaic Covenant. Um, and so what does this look like? Well, the simplest way is 
keep the Ten Commandments, you then get to stay in the Promised Land. Okay? So the conditional covenant is the Mosaic covenant made on Mount Sinai after the people have left Egypt. God gives them the Ten Commandments along with a whole bunch of other stuff. You have the sacrificial system, you have the laws of Leviticus, you have all these sort of things that make the people of God the people of God. But it's easier just to sort of think Ten Commandments here. And so you keep the Ten Commandments, you get to stay in the Promised Land. Uh, if... Um, if you break the Ten Commandments, then you get kicked out of the Promised Land. And this ends up happening in 587 BC with the fall of Jerusalem. Um, and so we see that a little bit in uh, Micah and Hosea and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and all these sort of things. Uh, a lot of the latter prophets. So how do, how do you understand? How do we start to sort of understand what the topic is in the latter part of the Old Testament? And the answer is the breaking of this covenant, of the Mosaic covenant, dictates all that's going to happen um, to the people of Israel and Judah. So if you want to understand the the latter prophets, basically the last third of your Old Testament. You have to understand the importance of the Mosaic Covenant and its conditions and how God expected the people to keep it so that they could stay in the Promised Land. Okay, that's the one conditional covenant in the Old Testament. There are then three other unconditional covenants. And what would those be? One would be the Noadic Covenant. So that's with Noah, as the name suggests. And that is no more destruction of earth um, in general or, or with a flood. So we're, there's not going to be a second flood. There's not going to be another cataclysmic event upon the earth um, because of sin. Uh, there is the new heavens and the new earth when Christ returns and restores all things, but that is not a, the same category of things here. Uh, so we don't have to worry about God destroying the world uh, prior to the Son's return. Uh, so that's the Noahic Covenant. No matter what, God is not going to destroy the earth. Doesn't matter how bad we get, doesn't matter if we keep promises, don't keep promises, the Noahic Covenant's going to stand until Christ returns. Okay? That's what make it unconditional. No matter what we do, God's not destroying the earth. All right. Second one is Abrahamic. Um, the Abrahamic covenant is uh, obviously to Abraham. God blesses nations. Okay? So all nations will be blessed through Abraham. This is the Abrahamic covenant. No matter what Abraham does, no matter what Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, um, this covenant is going to be kept no matter what. And, of course, we see the fulfillment of this with Jesus. Okay? Jesus fulfills the Abrahamic covenant. It is Christ who brings blessings to all nations. All right. And then the third of the unconditional covenants is the text for today, which is the Davidic covenant. Here we have a son of David rules forever. Okay, so a Davidic the Davidic covenant is the son of David rules forever, or his house is established forever. This we find right here in verse 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Here's the big star verse um, for this promise of this covenant. Um, now, obviously, this whole first part matters too, um, but this is where... Uh, while we're talking about covenants in Old Testament theology, uh, this is where this plays a role. Uh, so, here is Old Testament theology in a nutshell. Um, 
you could add a fourth, and this one um, is from other readings, uh, so my Old Testament professors doesn't count this one, but mention it anyway. There is a fourth, and it's the Adamic, Adamic, I don't know. It's the Adam covenant, and that is the promise of Genesis 3 of um, the woman will bear a son, and um, he shall crush your head, and you shall strike his heel. Um, and so it's the promise of uh, Christ over Satan. And so the, Ad the Adam covenant, of the Genesis 3 covenant, um, that was a terrible Cairo. Um, see, that one looks way nicer. Um, over, so Christ over Satan. Still not great, but you know, my handwriting's just awful, so that's the way it goes. Um, so back to the text here for a moment. Some pieces to, to look at and to, to understand besides just that last verse, but if you get the last verse under your belt, you've got the whole, the, got the big major point here. Um, but what else is going on here? Uh, this text is kind of funny in that uh, you see David think, I'm, I'm going to build this project for God. And then Nathan says, go right ahead and do it. And then God says, well, pump the brakes here, kids. Uh, it's not time for that. And that's sort of, the, I mean, when I read the sort of the image I picture is David thinks, yeah, I can, I can do this project. And Nathan says, yeah, go ahead. And no one asks mom or dad first, you know, if this would be a good idea. Um, you know, it's sort of like the kids want to build or want to dig a hole to China or something through the backyard and no one bothers to ask dad if he can borrow the shovel. Uh, and when dad finds out, he's like, what, what are you doing? Um, I, I would have put a stop to this if you would have just asked me in the first place. Um, and so there, I, I kind of feel like that's a little bit of the tone here in the first couple verses. Uh, that's obviously a little silly and, and uh, not exactly what's going on here. Uh, and you could kind of turn, and I mention this because if you view it that way, there is a second way of viewing this, uh, not as the, what are you kids doing down there, but a awe, what, look at what the kids are doing down there. And so this is the distinction between, um, you know, kids digging a giant hole in the backyard and uh, the kids got together on their own and made a nice card for mom and dad about how much they loved them. Um, and they wanted to use, you know, the nice stuff or whatever to make this card. And so it's sort of a, oh, that isn't that sweet sort of thing. And if that's the reaction that you, or the kind of tone that you put with God's words, um, then you sort of understand why maybe God, in return for this idea, establishes God or establishes David's house forever. You know, so in a, in a sense, if you're looking at big picture, what's happening here historically is that David is finally ruling at peace. Um, so the enemies aren't constantly uh, lay, or having a fights with him on his borders. Um, he's finally able to sort of settle things down. Um, his territory is secure. And so from here on out, and we're going to, and you see this if you keep reading 2 Samuel and Kings, um, David's only battles are to expand the territory already ha that he has now in chapter 7. Uh, so there's no more shrinking or borders being pushed in by the Philistines or being pushed by the Moabites or the Ammonites. And now David is going to start to expand his territory uh, through his military power. And so he's going to start winning and gaining uh, more territory uh, that, uh, of, of the promised land, in a sense. And so now that he is in this point of general peace and security, what's David's first thought? Is it, let's build a giant monument to me? No, it's, well, look, I've just brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and it's dwelling still in a tent while here I am in this beautiful palace. We need to build something for God. And so the, thought, the first thought of David as king in a, in a time in which he finally has the time, money, and ability to build something grand and beautiful, he dedicates that idea and that time and that effort and that money to the Lord. 
And so, you know, as we've been reading through Daniel, for example, in the Sunday Bible study, you see Nebuchadnezzar time and time again build grand things for him and his, uh, and, and his glory and to bring glory to, uh, to Babylon and to Nebuchadnezzar. And what David does is, is to, wants to bring glory to God in this, in this moment. And so there is this sort of, oh, well, this is, this is what sort of shows David's heart here is that uh, when God brings him peace, David responds to bring honor and glory to God. Uh, and so here we see David sort of as this, as this model of, uh, of faithfulness and of recognizing uh, when to give God glory and to, and, to, and, and to show him his love, I suppose. Now, of course, if you go that route, you do kind of run into the, is, did God choose David because of his good works problem? So when you think about it, it, when you frame the narrative in that way of the awe oh, isn't that cute sort of thing, um, you do run into the danger of bumping up against, well, this is why God did this for David. It's because he demonstrated his, his good works to God or wanted to bring God glory. Um, when we as Lutherans talk about it all the time that God doesn't need our good works and God has all the glory he needs without us sort of stepping in and, and forcing us to, to do that. Um, and so that's, that's the sort of the, the tension there with how we, how, we view, um, how we view this situation and how we view this narrative in this first part. If you go with the, the kids digging a hole in the backyard sort of thing, then it's why didn't, why didn't you ask if I wanted this? Why didn't you want that? And then we sort of still see God establishing David's kingdom regardless of whether or not uh, David wanted to do this grand, grand gesture. Uh, when we're looking at then, uh, so when we get past that first part about uh, David and Nathan and like, oh yeah, go ahead and build it, uh, everything's going fine. Uh, we do see some relationship in 6 and 7. So 6 and 7 deals with Israel's story. So Israel from Egypt, Israel um, being moved or moving all the people of Israel, uh, establishing judges to shepherd uh, the people of Israel. And so we sort of see this, these little elements here in 6 and 7 then be reflected again in David. Um, so David, David's story here in verse 8, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people. Uh, so this over my people, um, from the pasture, following the sheep, uh, sort of image or reflects this whole story up here in 7 and 8, or, yeah, or 6 and 7. And so there's a little bit of mirroring going on here between, um, between David and God's work through David and God's work through Israel as a nation. Um, and all of that's to sort of point that God, God is in control over all things again, um, which has sort of been the theme of Daniel thus far, that God is ruling over history. Uh, and I'll make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones on earth. Um, and so here we have in verse 10, more promises. I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them. This idea of being planted shows up often. Uh, we have, for example, Isaiah chapter something uh, about the vineyard. I feel like it's chapter 2, but I think I'm, uh, it might be 5. Um, but we also have things like Psalm 1, planted by the, 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 the water, uh, like a tree planted beside still waters. Um, in other references, so you have the, the vineyards, the plantings, um, so that, that pops up, that sort of language. Uh, so that they may dwell in their own place and, and be disturbed no more. Um, this sort of language here, they dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more, we find in uh, that certain sort of idea in Micah 4. Uh, so uh, last week's midweek uh, sermon about um, God promising uh, that men can rest under their own vine and fig tree um, and fear no more is sort of the same sort of language that we find here in um, 2 Samuel 7. Obviously predating it by a good 400, 500 years. Um, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. More the Lord declares to you, the Lord will make you a house. So the Lord will make you a house. Um, and here we're going we're gonna to find um, the house of David being established. Uh, for a very long time, and then also for forever. So this is 
This is carried out by Solomon and then Rehoboam and then uh, all those that follow uh, after him. Um, and so there is a long line of, of kings uh, throughout the history up until, uh, as I mentioned, um, 587 BC, in which we have the fall of Jerusalem and the fall of the line of David. Uh, now that's not to mean, and as we find in uh, the Gospels, the line of David is not lost, as in no one knows who's the, who belongs to David and who doesn't. Um, it's just that no one, they're not sitting on the throne anymore. Um, so, okay. Uh, that's, I gave you all the details I wanted on, on that text. I don't want to dive too much into any more specifics than that. We wanted, I wanted to talk about that uh, covenantal structure and why this plays a role. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more here about the house theme a little bit in Luke. Okay, so our third and final reading, and I think I'm going to probably preach on this, but again, it's Monday. I don't really know yet. Uh, I wish I had a stronger feeling about which text I'm preaching on, but I'm more worried about my Micah sermon on Wednesday at the moment. Uh, so let's look here at Luke 1, 26 to 38. And uh, it's the Annunciation to Mary by Gabriel. In the sixth month, this is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, which preceded this text. So don't think we're talking about um, June here. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Okay. There's a lot of things going on in this text. And there's a lot of side topics going on with this text that this text refers or informs and refers to and I'm going to try, I don't, know, I don't know why I bother trying, uh, not to go too far off the deep end on any one of these topics, but I'm going to try to bring a little bit of all the different things that are connected to this text because I don't get to talk about all the different things in the sermon. I got to stay focused, uh, but this, this text plays a role in a lot of conversations about a lot of different topics. So there's a couple to start with. And the first one is the idea of the Theotokos. Uh, so, Theotokos. And this phrase means mother of God. Okay? This in church history plays the role of a shibboleth for the early Christian church. Now, what is a shibboleth? A shibboleth is an Old Testament code word. So, a shibboleth is the word that 
only Hebrew people could pronounce correctly. So because of the way the Hebrew language worked in, um, in distinction from the other neighboring languages, the word shibboleth could only be pronounced by a true Israelite. Anyone else trying to pronounce the word shibboleth uh, would immediately be found out by their butchering of the word. Um, now, there are times in which we as a culture do the same thing as English speakers to, to those of other nationalities and home mother tongues. Um, you know, we often make fun of the way people use R's um, and TH's sounds and just English has its own shibboleths or odd, odd ways of speaking. Um, and so this, the point of me saying this is that a shibboleth is an Old Testament code word for belonging. Who belongs and who doesn't is what a shibboleth determines. Okay. And the theotokos is a Greek word. And it's a Greek code word. Uh, for, for who belongs into the proper church. So, this issue of Mary being the mother of God would determine your view of Christology or Christology. Okay? So, how do you understand who the Christ is could be quickly summarized by whether or not you confess Mary as the Theotokos. If you believe that Mary is the mother of God, it would say one thing about your Christology. If you confess that Mary is the mother of the Christ, the Christotokos, Tokos obviously means mother, mother of God or the mother of Christ, so if you change it to Mother of Christ, that says something else about your Christology. It makes a distinction between the two, two of the three persons of the Trinity. Is God the Father and God the Son equal? If they are equal, then the Son is as much God as the Father and the Holy Spirit. And so Mary, being the mother of Jesus, is also the mother of God. Um, and so, but if the Son is not equal to the Father, and that the Son is below the Father and not equal, so not equal, then he is simply the Christ and not God. So, I remember when I was learning about this at uh, church history class at Purdue, that my initial reaction was to bristle at this idea of calling Mary the mother of God because I am a good Lutheran, and giving too much honor to Mary makes me uncomfortable because I am Lutheran and I've been trained to not give overt praise and adoration to Mary. And so, hearing this title, Mother of God, given to Mary, felt a little too Catholic. Um, however, I was wrong. And the idea that, uh, that this phrase, Mother of God, brings adoration or uh, pray, overt praise to Mary is incorrect. By stating the that Mary is the Mother of God, we are, in fact, bringing proper praise to Christ. Okay? So, the mother of God, or Theotokos, gives the proper emphasis of who Christ is. And Mary, having this title, does not diminish um, this relationship, but reinforces it. And does that elevate Mary above others? Yes. And is that correct? Yes. Because none of you got to be mother of God. Uh, there's only one, and it's Mary, and she's special. Uh, and that's okay to say, even as a Lutheran. We can recognize the uniqueness, the specialness, the holiness of Mary, 
without going off the deep end and bringing her undue adoration and praise. Um, so that's one part of this conversation when talking about, the, about this text and the role that it plays. Because um, when we're looking at this, um, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Uh, some in the Catholic Church will translate this, Hail Mary, full of grace. Um, and so that's where the Hail Mary begins is in this text. So when we talk about that, you know, when we talk about Catholics and the Hail Mary and praying to Mary, uh, that doctrine begins here in this text. And it begins a little bit with the concept of Mary as the Theotokos. Um, but again, this, the whole point of this being a shibboleth um, versus the Christotokos people is to designate what you think about Jesus and not what you think about Mary. What you think about Mary is a side topic to this, this idea of Christ as fully God and equal to the Father. Okay, so that's tangent number one. What's tangent number two, you say? Because I know you, let's just get them all out of the way. It is right now December 14th, and if you have not yet uh, saw an article by Newsweek, by Time, by the New York Post, by you know whatever newspapers, some big newspaper magazine is going to put out some article that Christmas is a pagan holiday stolen from the Egyptians, stolen from the Romans, stolen from the Germans, uh, stolen from this, stolen from that. Uh, it's not actually our thing as Christians, but we've stolen it and incorporated pagan traditions into Christian traditions. And uh, isn't Christmas just ruined for you now, oh, you stupid Christians, for believing that you are the only ones who celebrate a virgin birth um, and the Son of God coming to the world? And don't you know that December 25th was the day in which uh, the Egyptians celebrated the sun god or whatever? Um, so you got 10 days and somebody's going to put out a news, uh, an article about it. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to pop up somewhere. You're, everyone's going to see it. You're going to ask me questions about it. And let's just start by saying, don't bother. It's stupid. And here's why. Okay. Here's how we got Christmas on December 25th. If you didn't know why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Okay. Here's how it works. I'm going to use over here. We have to start with the idea no birth certificates. Okay? No one has a birth certificate in the ancient world. All right? Most cultures didn't care when you were born and didn't mark birthdays. Uh, why? Well, probably because a lot of kids died all the time. The mortality rate of children was relatively high and birthdays and keeping track of when people were born wasn't done. So there are no birth certificates. We don't know when Jesus was born. Okay, that's a, there's absolutely no reason to think Jesus was actually born on December 25th. Okay, that's fine. We don't believe that Jesus was born on December 25th as a historical date. But you want to know why the church celebrates Jesus' birth on December 25th. Okay, so that's, there's a distinction here. There's a dis distinction between celebrating and, I don't know, it's not so much believing as um, historical date, okay? No one thinks the historical date of Jesus' birth is December 25th. However, we choose to celebrate that date for a reason. Now, what is the reason behind our celebration on December 25th? That begins with a concept of the Greek world that a prophet or 
even not even a prophet, but a significant figure. Okay, if you're a big shot, basically, or well known, you die on the day of conception. Okay? So, I don't know why this is the rule of thumb. I don't know who decided that this would be the tradition, but it's around. It's around for a long time in the Greek and Roman world that the big important people die on the day of their conception, and this is how we celebrate them. Okay, so we celebrate the day of their death because it is the day they also entered into the world. All right, because life begins at conception, even in the ancient world. This is not a Western 21st century problem against Planned Parenthood. People have believed this for a real long time. And so a prophet is born, or a big, an important person is, dies on the day that they're born, and so then we celebrate not only their death, but the day they entered into the world in, in their conception. Okay? So, Jesus, when does Jesus die? Well, the church believed that Jesus, well, Jesus dies on Passover Friday, right? In about, and the standard date is um, 30 or 33 AD. And I think they picked 33 AD for this, uh, this example. So when was Passover Friday in 33 AD? Well, that was in March 25th of 33 AD. And I have to double check. This might not, it might be 30, you know, at some point I'll get the date and sort it out and whatnot. But this is just generally speaking. So March 25th, is the date of the Passover Friday in which we believe Jesus died on. And according to the rule of thumb, a prophet or a significant figure like Jesus dies on the day of their conception. Okay? So March 25th, 33 AD, will this much mean that on March 25th of, you know, 0 AD, um, more than likely something like, three to four BC based on historical evidence. But whatever, on March 25th, three, um, three or four BC, he was conceived. And when was he conceived? When Gabriel shows up and speaks it. So God promises this is gonna happen. It happens immediately in the Annunciation. So the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary that very night of, her, uh, of Gabriel uh, uh, telling her this message. And what, Date is nine months later, because pregnancies take nine months, even the ancient world knows that. Nine months after March 25th, lo and behold, it's December 25th. This is the date of Jesus' birth. Okay? That's how Christmas dating works. So, you start with this principle that the day of your death is the day of your conception if you're a big shot. When does Jesus die? According to historical records in the ancient church, well, Passover Friday occurred on March 25th. March 25th then becomes the date uh, for Good Friday for, for time. And then we start moving it depending on the Passover because the Passover moves, so anyway. But the ancient church in its calendar says, okay, Jesus was conceived on March 25th. If we're going to celebrate his birth, it's going to be on December 25th. Uh, and that's where December 25th comes from. And believe it or not, church was celebrating on December 25th long before anybody else was. However, and this is the important part, uh, Christmas was a minor holiday and had been for a really long time. Um, Christmas only began to slowly um, be emphasized later on in the church year, or, or in, the, in the history of the church. Um, Easter is by far the more important day for the early church, uh, as well as other, other celebrations. Um, Pentecost, 
um, the Ascension. Uh, so Easter, Pentecost, Ascension, those days are really important. Um, but Christmas uh, does not play a big role until we in the West begin to keep track of birthdays. And we start celebrating birthdays and having um, the importance of celebrating birthdays be more important. And because Jesus is the most important, we need to know when Jesus' birthday is. And so Christmas has begun to be a more important holiday in, in the Eastern and Western churches, uh, just due to our own emphasis on birthdays in general. Uh, however, the doctrine of the Incarnation, uh, which is what we're getting after with this conversation, uh, has been a part of the early church for a very long time. So the fact, excuse me, the fact that Jesus is born in our flesh has always been important. Celebrating it on Christmas has not been. Okay. Back to the text, because those were the two tangents I wanted to get out of the way, because I figured that's what people were wondering about, and if you didn't, weren't, weren't wondering about that, now you know. Um, some things going on in the text. Uh, it's clearly stated that Mary is a virgin, uh, and that uh, plays a role in... Um, Anselm of Canterbury's theology, um, though I think I only know one person in the congregation at Trinity who has read Anselm, um, and so that's probably lost on some of you guys. And I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna rehash Anselm of Canterbury's argument of the incarnation and why Jesus or why God chose to do, um, why God chose Christ to enter through a virgin birth. Um, it's long, complicated, and uh, you'd have to read it for yourself a couple times before you kind of get what Anselm's laying down there. Um, but one of the things I did want to note here is that in the way uh, Luke conveys uh, this, the answer to this question, how will this be since I am a virgin, in 34, and the angel responds, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Um, therefore, the child to be born will be called holy. Uh, this is meant to avoid crassness um, or a carnal nature to the conception by God. Uh, God is not pulling a Zeus here and descending from heaven and having sex with Mary. Uh, this is not the point and this is not what's going to happen. Um, you know, the Greek gods were quite mischievous and um, were doing all sorts of things in their mythology. And this is not what Luke is trying to convey. Luke is trying to convey the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary in a non-sexual way that she remains a virgin even after she has conceived. Um, and the second part here, um, we'll get to some of the other topics here in just a second. Um, but while we're hanging out 34 and 35, um, we see Elizabeth, um, being mentioned in her old age, has also conceived a son. This is who? It's John the Baptist. Uh, so John the Baptist is now being mentioned. Uh, he's going to be mentioned later, and um, he was mentioned in last Sunday's text in John, and the text before that from Mark, uh, chapter 1. Um, and so uh, we see the importance of Elizabeth, her relative, and John the Baptist already being mentioned uh, in chapter 1 and then later in Luke's Gospel. Uh, and so, again, six months with her who was called barren. So this is how we know the sixth month reference in verse 26 refers to Elizabeth. Uh, not only because if we would just open up our Bibles and look at verse, you know, 1 through 25, we would have picked up that the topic was Elizabeth. Um, and so we see that this miraculous birth gives credence to Mary's miraculous birth. And so... Because we can look at this miracle, uh, because Mary can actually go and find her relative Mary, Elizabeth with child in her old age, she can be assured that the thing that, that the angel has spoken to her will come true as well. Uh, for nothing will be impossible with God. So help me if one of you puts that on a t-shirt and thinks that you can fly or something. Um, this is... God's promise for the Christ, not your promise to win a football game. Um, 
So please keep it in its context. Uh, Mary then said, Behold, I am your servant. She actually says slave girl or handmaiden of the Lord. Um, so let it be to me according to your word. This is a, a confession of faith um, and an, of acknowledgement of what God has said is good. And the angel then departs. Okay, so that's the end part. Let's look a little bit here at the top. Um, so we recognize here that Gabriel goes to Nazareth, which is where Mary is currently living, um, likely under the support of Joseph. So Joseph and Mary are already a couple. They are engaged. Um, they aren't living and sleeping together, but Joseph is likely caring for her. Or this is where Mary's family is from. It's a little hard to know. We know that Joseph's family is not from Nazareth, uh, but is in fact from Bethlehem. And if you're wondering what's going on, why does Nazareth play a role? Uh, why is Joseph and Mary there in the first place? Uh, Paul Meyer uh, states in his historical archaeological evidence and research that um, in Nazareth, Nazareth was the hub for another town being built by the Romans. Um, so if you have Nazareth over here as a town, over here is a construction site for a new Roman city. And so um, the workers who are building the town of, I forget what it is, um, it's, you know, maybe it doesn't have a name yet because it hasn't been built, uh, but the workers are living in Nazareth and working over here building homes. And so when it says that Joseph is a carpenter, it's not like he's necessarily building, you know, a table and chairs and a nice grandfather clock. He's likely building houses. He is a home builder. Um, and so there's some irony there when we're talking about building homes. But anyway, um, so Joseph is a home builder in Nazareth who is working over here for the time because that's where the work's at. And maybe he's dating a local, maybe while he's there, he, he wants to marry a local girl uh, and, and take her back to Bethlehem when he's done working. Um, however, uh, because Jesus uh, is known as Jesus of Nazareth, it might be that Joseph uh, takes up permanent residence after their return trip uh, from Egypt. So he bypasses Bethlehem um, and Jerusalem and goes back to Nazareth to live and to work. Uh, so more than likely, Joseph is living in Nazareth to help build this city over here, and he spends the rest of his life uh, in Nazareth building this town. And Jesus also learns to build houses, uh, more than likely, because he's the carpenter's son. He likely has to go and help his father work on the houses. Um, so that's why they're in Nazareth. Um, I'm just going to throw some extra Christmas details around because I don't get to tell you all the things I know about the first couple chapters of Matthew and Luke on Christmas Day and Christmas Eve. Um, so the virgin's name is Mary. Mary is a relative of Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the daughter or is of the tribe of Aaron. Um, and so sometimes that gets a little confusing whether or not Mary is a descendant of David or not because obviously Jesus is not exactly a descendant of Joseph as in he is the, his adopted son. Um, and so some people get hung up on the, whether or not the adoption counts as being from the line of David. Um, as an adoptive father, my children are gumses, no matter what people say. Um, so, you know, that line of argument doesn't go very far with me. Um, but some people make that argument that Mary also is of the tribe of David and Judah. Um, so... Uh, but we know that one of the, her parents are likely uh, from the tribe of Aaron. But that leaves the other one to probably be from David. So you can, you can focus on that if you really want to. But Matthew points Jesus' Davidic line through Joseph and not through Mary uh, because it's through the father's line that you get um, status. So I don't, we can make a, you can make a case. But the adoptive, uh, being the adoptive son of Joseph is sufficient for me anyway. And so then this angel comes to Mary. Uh, Greetings, O favor, when the Lord is with you. And she's greatly troubled at the saying. Now, uh, often when angels show up, people get a little troubled because, you know, they think they're dead uh, because they're seeing uh, spiritual beings show up and greet them. And if I saw a spiritual being show up and greet me, I would think that I must have died 
because why would I see a heavenly being unless, of course, I was dead? So that usually causes the trouble. However, in this text, it's different because she is troubled not at the presence of the angel, but at the presence of or what is being said. She's troubled at the saying. She doesn't know what it means to be the favored one of the Lord. Um, and so she's trying to figure out what in the world does that mean? And the angel then says to her, do not be afraid, Mary. So it's not a, it's not a bad thing. Um, and please don't be scared of me. Uh, you found favor with God and behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Um, conceive in your womb. Here is my connection with 2 Samuel 7. God has built a house for himself. Uh, so seeing the womb of Mary, who is now the Theotokos, as the temple of God for nine months. Um, so that's just a little interesting thing to think about. Um, and you shall call his name Jesus. It's not Jesus um, so much as it is. And I was trying to explain this to Asha the other day. Uh, Joshua, which is God is my salvation, or God's salvation. So Jesus is actually Joshua in Hebrew, or Yeshua. Yeshua then gets translated into Latin and then into English, and we get Jesus. So this whole connection of Jesus to Joshua is completely lost. Um, on the English reader. So I, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, we recognize Jesus as Jesus, uh, though if you were to call him Joshua, that would be uh, okay too. Uh, however, pray, play, praying to the great and mighty Josh uh, would get some raised eyebrows. So Joshua or um, this is what I was trying to explain uh, to Asha uh, the other day. So she saw IHS on my stole, and she asked what that meant. And I said, it's the abbreviation for Jesus's name, which of course doesn't make any sense to her. Um, but what this looks like is Josh, if you were to put it back in its original language and to translate it back into English. So what, what does the IHS stand for? It stands for Josh, which is right there, which is the shorthand. Oops, sorry. So IHS, short for Josh. Josh is the shortened name for Yeshua, which is the name for Jesus. So why can IHS mean Jesus? Because IHS stands for Yeshua in Latin, which is then translated to Josh, which is then really Jesus. Uh, so what does it mean for Jesus to be named Jesus? It means that he is God's salvation for his people, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. So he is the Son of God, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father, David. And this is why we have 2 Samuel 7 as our Old Testament lesson, because of this promise right here of God fulfilling his covenant to David. Uh, so that's the point of having all those texts together. Uh, they're all pointing to the Old Testament mystery being revealed, the Old Testament covenants uh, being fulfilled in the house of God, uh, being built both by Solomon and by Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit. She becomes the mother of God, uh, who bears the Son of God, and who bears the salvation of all mankind uh, to the world. So that's all the different topics I wanted to talk about in this hour of Bible study. Um, and so there's, there's obviously more going on here with these texts. We could talk a lot about covenantal theology and what that means um, and how that sort of shapes biblical theology and our own theology as Lutherans. We could talk a little bit more about Mary as the mother of God and what it means for Christ to be both God and man in the incarnation. But these are kind of, Christ, uh, that one is a Christmas theme that will probably come up in the lectionary Bible studies in the season of Christmas, uh, talking about the incarnation of, of God and what it means for Christ to have our flesh, um, both all the way from conception to death, he inhabits our flesh. 
Uh, and so we'll talk about that probably as, as Christmas uh, gets, gets here. Um, so that's, uh, those are kind of themes. I have no idea where we're going to take these texts for the sermon yet, and that's fine because I like to keep you in suspense uh, for Sunday. And, uh, and so uh, this is where we'll leave it for today. I hope you, had, um, hope you learned something new and something that you find edifying. Uh, and I hope to see you either on Wednesday or Sunday. If not, join us online uh, for those services. Have a great rest of your week.